a generation has gone by already and uh, and many of these people have passed away or are passing away. Tonight, Chief Rudy Turtle heads to Ottawa after the Indigenous Services Minister testified on his failed deal at Grassy Narrows. It's a huge uh, missed opportunity by the Senators delaying like this. Time is ticking away for the Senate to come to terms with Indigenous rights recognition in Canada. And two years after a young Enoch's death in jail, a family in Nunavik is still waiting for answers from Quebec. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News, I'm Dennis Ward. The Chief of Grassy Narrows First Nation was in Ottawa today. Last week it looked like a deal had been made to provide his community with a mercury treatment facility. But it fell apart at the last minute. So as Todd Lamoran reports, Chief Rudy Turtle traveled to Parliament Hill and testified before the House's Indigenous Affairs Committee. I'm not overly confident, but I hope, I hope it can be done. Chief Rudy Turtle said that after having just left the House's Indigenous Affairs Committee. Turtle wants an $89 million mercury treatment facility built in his community of Grassy Narrows. A generation has gone by already and, uh, and many of these people have passed away or are passing away and uh, that's why we would like to get this uh, facility done. On May 29th, Indigenous Affairs Minister Seamus O'Regan arrived in Grassy Narrows to sign an agreement, but there was no deal. O'Regan told the same committee earlier in the week that he spoke to Chief Turtle on the phone the evening before and project timelines and funding costs had been agreed to. When we spoke the night before, uh, we were in agreement on, uh, on all of those issues. Uh, when I arrived in community, uh, they had changed. I don't know where he got the impression that I was going to sign the, the papers when I, when I clearly told his team that I, I have to take this home for approval. And I, I just can't say yes. Chief Turtle clarified to committee members he wanted the $89 million put into a trust fund. One reason? To hedge against a possible change in government. But bureaucrats for Indigenous services claimed that was not how funding agreements have been done in the past. For the minister ex to expect Chief Turtle to sign something when they haven't worked out the logistics of the funding I think was incredibly naive. Everyone in committee agreed mercury poisoning and grassy narrows was a tragedy. So NDP MP Nikki Ashton tried a motion to have the funding immediately put into a trust. It was denied. It's very concerning that we have two weeks left of Parliament, that we're heading into a federal election, and that for, uh, for 500 days essentially, uh, and, and many more years before that, Grassy Narrows has been uh, living a, uh, a nightmare. Later that same day, the UN Rapporteur for Human Rights and Toxics, Basket Tunkak, gave his preliminary report after touring Canada for two weeks. He found it troubling that mercury poisoning and grassy narrows had been known for 50 years, but little remediation had been done to date. In particular, the inaction for many decades really leaves in my mind questions of discrimination and to what extent that community and other communities in Canada are protected from discrimination. Another kicker from this morning's committee is learning that the province of Ontario is still assessing mercury levels found at the pulp mill in Dryden. Nobody knows at this point if that toxin is leaching into the groundwater and making its way downstream to Grassy Narrows. Needless to say, Chief Turtle is very concerned. Todd Lamoran, APTN National News, Ottawa. Still in Ottawa, last night the Senate Standing Committee on Aboriginal Peoples was scheduled to hear from final witnesses and complete one of the last steps before the UNDRIP Bill C-262 could become law. But Conservative Senators had the meeting cancelled at the last minute. One of the witnesses set to testify was Assembly of First Nations National Chief Perry Bellegarde, who was left standing outside the empty Senate. It's uh, an opportunity lost about uh, rights recognition and implementation. I think it's going to create further economic uncertainty and st instability in Canada, uh, you know, when it comes to the economy. If you, if you want to create economic certainty, you got to respect rights, title, and jurisdiction, and it's going to be a missed opportunity. So it's a it's a huge uh, missed opportunity by the senators delaying like this. The term genocide has been dominating the news cycle this week, after the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls used the term to describe violence against women. 
The Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg originally wouldn't refer to the continuing atrocities against Indigenous peoples as genocide. Brittany Hobson brings us up to date. The National Enquiry's final report reiterated what many Indigenous peoples have been saying for years, that acts against the first peoples of this land equate to genocide. To eradicate their existence as nations, communities, families and individuals is the cause of the disappearances, murders and violence experienced by Indigenous women, girls, 2S LGBTQIA people, and this is genocide. Since the report was released, the question of what is and isn't genocide has been playing out across all forms of media. On Monday, Commissioner Michelle Audette was quick to refute deniers. To the people that don't think that there is a genocide today, we have 1,200 pages to prove it. Recently, a national museum criticized for not recognizing the treatment of Indigenous peoples as genocide has changed its stance. The Canadian Museum for Human Rights uh, has recognized uh, genocide as an appropriate term um, in uh, discussing uh, and um, studying uh, policy, public policy towards Indigenous peoples in Canada. It's part of a colonial experience. But this wasn't always the case. In 2014, officials said this. Well, we don't have the um, prerogative legally to make that judgment if it's you know, homicide or genocide. But what we can do is present the evidence um, and encourage that debate. John Young is the president of the CMHR. He says the museum changed its view after the Truth and Reconciliation called residential schools a form of cultural genocide. He adds the museum no longer uses classifications of genocide when describing atrocities Indigenous people have faced. A better way to recognize the harm done, the challenges we face as a country going forward, is to just recognize genocide. Brittany Hobson, APTN National News, Winnipeg. You can't speak of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls without talking about the role men play. The Moose Hide Campaign formed in 2011 to encourage Indigenous men to stand up against and to pledge to end violence against women. Paul Assert is the founder of the Moose Hide Campaign and joins us from Vancouver to discuss what the National Enquiry's final report should mean to men. Paul, thanks for taking some time for us here today. Now, there wasn't a lot mentioned in the report to single out our men. What do you make of that? Yeah, I think uh, the, the report was so critical uh, in giving us a, a pathway to, to move forward. Uh, I think there's so much more work that needs to be done uh, in, uh, in, in seeking effective ways for us to engage men and boys uh, and more specifically to, to speak to the healing that needs to happen uh, amongst the men, uh, certainly in our communities and, and in the non-Indigenous communities across Turtle Island. The final report says everyone in the country has a role in addressing violence against Indigenous women and girls. What do you think the role of the individual Indigenous man is? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I was expecting uh, to read the report and, and see an underlying message that um, men need to stop hurting women. and. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's a, a fundamental reality that, that we can't uh, get away from. And it's really important that we, uh, each and every one of us uh, as men, um, look in the mirror and, uh, you know, really um, be honest with ourselves about uh, how we think and feel uh, about women and, and specifically how we think and feel about Indigenous women. And, and all of us can, can reach for our higher selves. Uh, and I think, you know, the light is shining bright on us as men, and in, in not just in, in, the, in the MMIW uh, report context, but in the, in the broader Me Too movement. So, so the time is now for, for each and every one of us as, as men and boys to, to step up and, and, uh, um, and, and you know, embrace uh, healthier forms of masculinity. Do you think there are other things that men can do collectively to take this issue on? Yeah, absolutely, Dennis. Uh, one of the things that we have been practicing in, in the Moosehide campaign 
uh, is uh, very um, clear and, and, and direct um, statements and actions um, that, uh, that really show the, the, the depth of our commitment and, and the seriousness uh, that we take this issue with. Um, and so uh, we are inviting men and boys to participate in a one-day fast, uh, not eating or drinking um, any food or water uh, for one day. Um, as, a, as a, I guess, a clear indication of, of uh, our commitment to, to be better and, and to help in the healing process and to work towards ending violence uh, against uh, women and children. And, and so we're, we're certainly uh, uh, looking for, for new and innovative ways to, to continue to advance uh, that healing journey. Paul, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks so much for taking some time for us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. An Inuit family is still looking for answers after a 24-year-old man's death in police custody. That story and more still to come. Here's a look at your Friday forecast starting on the East Coast. 23 under the sun for Fredericton. 7 with showers for Nain and Kuchuak. 14 with showers in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Sunny and 24 for Montreal. 14 under the sun in Shibugamu. Sunny and 23 for Toronto. 24 above in Ottawa under sunny skies. 24 and showers for Thunder Bay. 29 and sunny in Sioux Lookout. 13 for Churchill. Showers and 16 in God's Lake. 32 for Winnipeg and Gimli. Same in Brandon but with rain on the way. 28 in Estevan. 21 and showers in Saskatoon. Rain and 14 for Meadow Lake and LaRange. Welcome back. Today in Quebec City, chiefs and representatives from four nations gathered to unveil a newly signed alliance, asserting their sovereignty, self-determination and territorial rights. Chiefs from the Maliseet, Abenaki, Atikamekw, and Inu nations say the decision to join forces was months in the making. Together, the leaders will collaborate on matters regarding economic and cultural development on common ancestral territory. They say the signed agreement promotes a more harm harmonious coexistence and pushes back against the government's attempts to create division among First Nations. This land is important to all of us to all our nations as one. We will stand and we will fight for this. It is our right, it is the right of our ancestors to know that we are protecting it still. For this is the reason why we have come together and we'll stand behind this. Two years after a 24-year-old man's death in police custody, an Inuit family is still waiting for answers about how he died. Even though an investigation has long since been completed, important details such as who was supposed to be looking after the young man are missing. APTN's Tom Fenario has the story. It doesn't take any prompting to get Louisa Surasila to play a video of her son, Sivouak, dancing. Sivouak won awards for the half tap dance, half jig hybrid style that is popular in the Nunavik region. Here he is dancing in his hometown of Pavernatuk. Sivouak also loved hockey, especially Washington Capitals left winger Alexander Ovechkin. On April 28, 2017, at 6.28 a.m., the 24-year-old posted this on Facebook. Good morning. I hope I'll see Ovechkin someday in heaven. About 11 hours after its posting, Sivouak would be found dead in the jail cell in Pervonatok. They found out around 5.30 <laughs> and his body was already cool. This press release by Quebec's Director of Prosecution details the broad strokes of what happened. The Katavik Regional Police Force received a call at 9.20 a.m. from a man requesting help getting drunk people out of his home. Two Katavik police officers arrived at the scene minutes later and took two inebriated men out of the house. Police dropped the first individual at home, during which time Sivouak appears to fall asleep in the car. Sivouak 
Police took him to the Vavernatuk police station to sober up. According to the release, officers put Sivuak in a cell and placed him on his stomach. It then jumps ahead to 5.13 p.m. when a civilian guard informs police that Sivuak is not responding to the guard's attempts to wake him. When police arrive, they find that Sivuak hasn't moved since they put him in the cell. Sivuak is pronounced dead at 5.47 p.m. at the Pravernatuk Health Center. The cause of death is later found to be alcohol poisoning. But the pathologist could not exclude Sivuak's body position in the cell as a possible cause of death. Officials conclude that there was no grounds to press charges of criminal negligence against Katowic police. When they arrested him, there was no guard. No one was there. Sivuak's sister Freddie says that investigators told the family that there was no one to replace the overnight guard when Sivuak was brought in. When there is no guard, a police officer is supposed to take over duties. Officials won't say whether anyone was keeping an eye on Sivuak when he was brought in until the evening shift guard discovered his body. April 28, 2017 was the worst day of my life. In this statement her mother wrote and that Freddie translated to English, it's clear that it's something the family would like clarified. They took too long to find out that he was dead. I thought they have cameras. They neglected him. Quebec's Independent Investigation Bureau, known by its French acronym, BEI, is responsible for investigating incidents where a person dies or is seriously injured by police in Quebec. They are responsible for investigating Sivouac's death. When the Sirocida family contacted the BEI for their full report, they were referred to the Quebec coroner. The Quebec coroner's website is in French, and the Sirocida family speaks in Nuktatut with English as their second language. APTN News has made repeated requests for the coroner's report, which, unlike the BEI report, is open to the public by law. The coroner says the investigation is effectively completed, but the file must then be the subject of an administrative control, and that the report should be made public in a few weeks. Five months later, and two years after Sivuak's death, the coroner report has not been made public. APTN also asked Katowic Police Chief Jean-Pierre Larose for clarification on whether or not there was a guard on duty the morning of Sivuak's death. Larose declined to comment and directed APTN to the BEI. Merci, uh... But in November 2018, LaRose testified before the Quebec inquiry into the relationship between Indigenous people and public services. Inquiry lawyer Paul Crepeau pressed LaRose on the state of the region's jail cells. LaRose told the commissioner that they don't have enough officers to patrol communities and staff the jails. Because they want to make sure they have enough officers on patrol, they hire civilian guards. J'ai mandaté un capitaine, il, il est en train de relancer le recrutement et l'embauche de gardiens civils parce que dans certaines communautés, on n'en a pas beaucoup. LaRose adds that if for whatever reason there is no civilian guard, an officer is supposed to do it. Évidemment, on peut pas laisser des détenus en cellule sans gardiennage aucun. Absolument pas. Bon. The Quebec Inquiry is not the only public institution to take a long look at Pervernatuk's jail. In 2016, Quebec's ombudsman released its own report calling for major changes to infrastructure to reduce crowding. But when it comes to Sivouac's case, there appears to be little appetite to look further into the details of his death. Quebec prosecutors, who have the power to recommend the coroner do an inquest, did not. The Quebec coroner would not say whether or not there will be an inquest into Sivouac's death. Katowic police declined to comment on whether they have adopted new protocols regarding dealing with severely inebriated individuals or whether their chronic underfunding may have led to Sivouac being left unattended. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Cerro Sila family is waiting to see the case files. Every day I thought of him, how he died. Two years after, it appears that the Cerro Sila family are the only ones who are still thinking of Sivouac. Tom Fenario, APTN National News, Pavernatuk, Quebec. Tragic story. Time for another quick break, but then we have a preview of the final episode of the 10th season of APTN Investigates. Stick around. Here's the rest of your Friday forecast. Picking back up in northern Alberta, rain and 9 for high level, 13 and sunny in Peace River. 18 above with the sun out in Medicine Hat, a high of just 7 for Calgary. 17 in Victoria with rain, rain and 19 for Campbell River. Showers and 12 in Fort Nelson, sunny and 17 for Smithers. 
Rain for Old Crow with a high of 17. 22 under the sun in Dawson. 14 for Fort Liard and Trout Lake. 10 in Yellowknife. Plus 2 in Saks Harbor. 4 above in Politak. 12 in Colville Lake. 6 for Repulse Bay. Plus 3 in Chesterfield, Whale Cove and Baker Lake. 5 with showers in Pangertongue. 0 in snow in Clyde River. Welcome back. In Saskatchewan, the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations say they support Battleford Tribal Chiefs in their call for the immediate halt of construction on an archaeological site located within their territory. Construction of a rural road has begun and even after several artifacts were uncovered by the owners of the land. The landowners west of Bigger Saskatchewan found several archaeological and culturally significant artifacts that may date back 10,000 years. FSIN Chief Bobby Cameron says they will go to the courts to save culturally sensitive sites from the careless destruction of the province. Well, it's important for our First Nations right across this country and world that they understand, that all levels of government understand and recognize and realize that First Nation people, we, we were, we are the original people of these lands. The artifacts that were found recently um, clearly indicates that, that we occupied these lands. We practiced and exercised our inherited treaty right in all aspects. And I can tell you that project has been halted while council reviews how to move forward. Tomorrow on APTN Investigates, Trina Roach takes a look at hockey and how the Mi'kmaq people are making their claim to the game. Here's a preview. It's, it's a great honor to be recognized. Hockey, one of Canada's national sports. Across Turtle Island, Indigenous people play the game and love the game. You get a rush, and just like adrenaline rush, like it's just a really good feeling like when you step on the ice. But hockey has a dark side. I faced racism before, but not at this level. It was too, it's too much. And in the arena of reconciliation, some Mi'kmaq want recognition. And one thing consistent about the evolution of hockey is the Mi'kmaq are always a part of it. The Mi'kmaq are staking a claim on hockey, its origins and its future. Looks good. You can watch the full story tomorrow right here after the news. And that's your APTN National News for this Thursday. For more, visit our website, aptnnews.ca, and download the APTN News app. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.